prepare for that final exam. So let's jump in with question number one. A circle has a radius of three centimeters. Let me see how good I can be at drawing a circle here so I can visualize what's going on. So the radius is from the outside of the circle to the center. So that is three centimeters. We have to find two things here. We have to find the area and we have to find the circumference. Both of these have a formula that we can use to find them. So area equals, hopefully this sounds familiar to you, pi r squared. That squared is very important. So what this means is that I'm going to take, well, what is r? It's three, because r means the radius. So I'm going to take pi, the number that I'm gonna use is 3.14. I'm gonna multiply that times the radius squared, which is three times another three. So 3.14 times three times another three. And my answer, I believe, is, let me make sure I, I don't lead you straight here. Yes, my answer is 28.26. 28.26, and the units on this, remember that whenever we're finding the area of a two-dimensional shape, 28.26 centimeters squared. So whenever we're finding the area of an entire shape, our units need to be squared. So it has to be a centimeter squared. All right, moving on, the circumference, which is, in case you forgot what the circumference is, it is the perimeter going around the edge of the circle. And the formula that we can use for circumference is circumference equals pi times what? Pi times radius? Close, it's pi times diameter. And what is diameter? Well, diameter is two times the radius. So in this situation, the diameter is going to be two times three, which is six. So we're gonna take pi or 3.14 times six, and we get as our answer 18.84. This time, we do not need to square those centimeters. It just stays as 18.84 centimeters. Double checking to make sure I'm right on that before moving on. Hope you guys are having an awesome day. Hope you had some good cereal or something this morning, I don't know. Question two, Seamal the engineer, wow. Congratulations on the career change. Test the strength of a new material by seeing how much weight it can hold before breaking. Previous tests have held these weights in pounds. So it looks like Seamal has had an experiment seven different times. We have seven different pounds or weights that the material has held before breaking. So those are the seven experiments is what we call them in statistics and probability. Do you think that this material will be able to hold more than a thousand pounds in the next test? Explain your reasoning. So our answer is gonna be yes, but why is it yes? It is because six out of those seven tests have been more than a thousand. So you know that if you try something out seven times and it works six out of those seven times, it's probably gonna work the next time too, okay? Just using common sense and logic. Uh, the other answers don't work on this one. Uh, this one, yes, because it can hold any amount without breaking, that's obviously false because we already know that it did break after these seven experiments at those weights. So that is not gonna be the correct answer. Moving on, question three. This is a review from our last unit of angles, finding these missing angles. So there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. Um, we can look at either supplementary angles first or vertical angles first. I'm gonna look at vertical angles first, um, just to see how that works. So our vertical angles, our vertical angles, which means that their degree measurements must be what if they are vertical? It means they must be the same. So our vertical angles in this case, are formed on opposite sides of intersecting lines. So we have 7x plus 7, and we know that that has to have the exact same degree measurement as 112 degrees. So now it just becomes a problem of solving this equation. So the first step is going to be to get rid of the number that's not multiplied by the variable. So we want to get rid of plus 7, 
by subtracting seven from both sides. And we get seven X equals 112 minus seven is gonna be 105. And our final answer is gonna be 105 divided by seven, which seven goes into 10 once, and it goes into 35, 15. Okay, so that checks out so far because I see a couple of my possible answers have X is 15, but now we need to figure out what Y is gonna be. How are we gonna figure out what Y is? Let me get to grab a different color. We're gonna use supplementary angles. Let's use supplementary angles. And the supplementary angles that I see here, that as a reminder, supplementary angles add up to be 180. I see 4y and 112. So 4y plus 112 is going to have to be, if you add those angles together, 180. So let's go through our steps again. Our first step is going to be similar to the last one, to get rid of the number that is not multiplied by the variable. So in this case, getting rid of plus 112 is done by subtracting 112 from both sides. OK, so we get 68 equals 4y. y is equal to 68 divided by 4, which is going to be 17. I did some mental math there. Hopefully, you were able to follow along. But um, if I put together my two answers, I get that is my final. OK, number four, you want to estimate the number of students in middle school who buy school lunch. Which sample is best? OK, so the key in this problem is that we are trying to estimate the number of students in where? In the entire middle school. So the answer that's going to be correct here is if I want to know about the entire middle school, I want to pick people randomly from each age group because I don't know if the sixth graders might, for whatever reason, be buying more school lunch or the eighth graders might be buying more. I want to get a sample that represents everyone in my, this is what we call our population. So I want my sample to reflect that population, which means that I don't want to exclude the sixth, seventh, or sixth graders, seventh graders, or eighth graders. I want to be including as many of that target population as I can. So the correct answer is a random sample of sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And you might be thinking, um, actually, we'll, we'll go on. I think that's enough explanation. So question five, what is the likelihood that when Ann Perkins rolls a six-sided number cube, she will roll a five? So Ms. Simon talked about this in her video. A six-sided number cube, um, it basically means a die or plural, a dice. Um, but we're not allowed to refer it that way because it's kind of like gambling. So you guys know what a dice looks like, like in a game. So it has six sides. The numbers are one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so how likely is it that she'll roll a five? Okay, nice of her to take a job off of her nursing, okay, during this time, her nurse job to roll a dice. So five is one out of six of the options. So our answer is one six, because five is one out of these six options. That's if it is a fair dice, which we always assume that it is, that it's not weighted weird, that I don't know, it's not rigged in any way. Okay, question six, Natasha, I don't know how to say the last name actually, but I'm pretty sure this is a Black Widow, rolls a six-sided die 400 times. Um, this word fair right here, this is what I was just referring to. That means that it's not weighted weird at all, that we would expect each of those six numbers to be rolled the same amount. So how many outcomes would we expect to be an even number? So this is what we refer to as, and once again, Ms. Sima talked about this on quiz number one in her video. This refers to the theoretical probability. The theoretical probability, it's hard to write and talk at the same time, is always, what do we expect? So in this problem, we expect okay, even numbers to be rolled about half the time, right? Because our um, potential numbers, like we talked about up here, are one, two, three, four, five, six. Half of those numbers are even numbers, two, four, and six. So we would expect half of those half of those 400 rolls to be even numbers. So our expected theoretical probability is 
200. Is that going to be exactly what the results end up being when Natasha does the experiment? Probably not, unless, um, I don't know. It could happen, obviously. She could roll exactly 200, but most likely not going to happen. So that is why the theoretical probability can be different than the ex actual experiment, the experimental probability. She might roll 198, 199. She might roll like 204. Um, anyway, that's not covered by the question. We got our answer here. That's just some extra information about theoretical probability and experimental probability. Number seven, the results of a spinner experiment are 25% red, 26% blue, 24% yellow, and 25% green. Which of the following is most likely true about the spinner? So there's a couple of questions on or answers on here that are really, really close. And those are that green and yellow make up half the area of the spinner, and that the spinner has equal parts of red, blue, yellow, and green. I hope you guys can see how both of these seem like they should be correct. Green and yellow could definitely make up half of the spinner because 24% plus 25% is a total of 49%, which is really close to half. So I don't know, like that could be true, but that's actually not going to be the correct answer on this one. The answer is going to be the spinner has equal parts of red, blue, yellow, and green. And why, why is that the answer, guys? I don't love this question, to be honest with you. But just to get you exposed to difficult uh, questions like this and get you to see what the question is looking for, the key is which is most likely true. And this one is most likely true because it has more information about all four of the colors. So that the spinner has equal parts of red, blue, green and yellow so that means that there's 25 percent of each of those so choice on mine it's the bottom choice but on yours it might be a different choice so this choice that i've selected it has more information about all of the colors um, and that's kind of the best explanation i can give for that one question eight lewis stevens one of my favorite tv characters ever has eight shirts four pairs of pants three ties and two pair of shoes that sounds like my wardrobe. If Lewis's school uniform consists of a shirt, a pair of pants, a tie, and a pair of shoes, how many different uniforms can he wear to school? So I'm going to draw this out so you can kind of see. Um, let me kind of narrate as we're going through. Actually, that's going to take too long. I'm just going to say S represents shirts. So we have eight shirts right here. So for each of those eight shirts all right i want you to visualize whatever shirt i have a cool shirt on today it's like a dog okay there are four pairs of pants that could go with each of those shirts so see if you can follow along with the drawing that i'm making right now see how i'm gonna have four p's that could go with each of these shirts and i'm gonna run out of space really quick so i'm just gonna do it for those top three shirts but pretend that i went all the way down to the bottom. So each of those shirts has four potential pairs of pants that goes with it. Now, for each possible shirt and pants combination, I have three different ties that could go with each of those. So for each of those combinations, I have three ties. And this is a cool type of probability um, problem that has a lot of practical application here, seeing the different combinations of things that you can make. So you're following from this one shirt that I have, I could have four pants go with that shirt. And then for each of those shirt and pants combinations, I could have three ties with each of them. Okay, the next part is for each of those shirts, pants, ties, just a spiffy looking outfit, you can mix it up even more by wearing one of two pairs of shoes. So each of those ties, is going to have two pairs of shoes. OK, so you're probably thinking to me, and I'm just going to stop right there, but you get the idea. You're probably thinking to me, wow, this is a really complicated diagram. Do I have to draw this? No, but I just wanted you to visualize um, that the way that we get this final answer is we start with our eight shirts. 
Each of those eight shirts can get four pairs of pants going with it. Then each of those combinations can have three different ties. And then each of those can have two different pairs of shoes. So in conclusion, if we want to figure out the answer to this question, all we have to do is multiply the amount of options we have for each um, aspect of the things that we're combining, of the combination. So eight times four is 32. Okay, 32 times three. Well, I know 33 times three is 99, so I'm gonna subtract three and get 96. And then 96 times two, hopefully that's one of our answers, is 192. So Lewis, if he wanted to, I mean, 192 is pretty close to the amount of days in the school year. He could probably wear a brand new outfit every single day. Okay, find the most simplified equivalent expression of the following. 5x plus 2. Um, I would just, okay, I just panicked for a second because I thought that we were recording and I was going to have to do all this again, but we are recording. So 5x plus 2 minus 8x plus 6. Okay, this is going to be a combining like terms problem because if I want to simplify this, I want to get rid of parentheses. Do I see any parentheses? No, so I'm going to combine like terms. So my like terms are going to be the 5x and the minus 8x and then the positive 2 and the positive 6. Okay, I can combine the 5x and the minus 8x because both of them have um, both of them have an x multiplied by it. So 5x minus 8x, we want to take the sign in front of each of the numbers, is going to be negative 3x. And then the positive 2 plus 6 is going to be positive 8. So is that a choice? Yes, indeed. Okay, um, we get another question right here. This is going to involve combining like terms as well. Question number 10, select two equivalent expressions for 1 -sixth uh, parentheses 12x plus 36 plus 7x. So I see that all of my answers down here, none of them have parentheses. So the first thing that I want to do with the expression that I'm starting with is to get rid of the parentheses. How do I get rid of the parentheses? Distributive property. All right, so let's do the distributive property right here. One sixth, we're going to multiply. Remember, distribute means to multiply. 1 sixth times both of the terms inside the parentheses. So 1 sixth times 12x. 1 sixth times 12 is kind of like 12 divided by 6. So that's going to be 2. And I can't leave behind that x because I'm multiplying by that x too. So it's going to be 2x. Then 1 sixth times 36. Well, that's kind of like 36 divided by 6. So 36 divided by 6 is going to be. Six, and we don't have an X with that one, okay? And then I can't forget about my plus seven X hanging out there on the end. All right, so I have done one step of simplifying. I have taken this and turned it into this. I've gotten rid of the parentheses. Let's pause right there and see if any of our answers matches what we have so far. I spy an answer, there we go. Let's get that one circled, but we need two equivalent expressions. So. I'm guessing that I can simplify this a little bit more by looking for like terms. Can I add together any of the like terms? Well, I have my 2x and my 7x that I can add. Can I add the, uh, the plus 6? No way, man. Don't try to do something silly like that. It doesn't have an x with it. So if I add together 2x and 7x, I get 9x and then a plus six okay yeah these videos are fun all right right there so we found our two options moving on okay different events have the following likelihoods um which is the least likely so likelihood means like the probability that it's going to happen so which is the least likely to happen which is the most likely to happen so i always think of these in terms of basketball um with percentages, you can see that some of these are percentages, some of them are fractions, like eight out of 10, you can think of that as like a fraction, like eight tenths or a division problem. 
we have decimals like 0 0.37, we have another percentages, and then we have another fraction. So all of these, even though they look different, we are gonna be able to um, compare them to each other. So let's do that now. Um, what should we make all these? Should we make them all decimals? Let's go ahead, let's make all these decimals, okay? So what is 60% as a decimal? Well, I know if I wanna change a percent to a decimal, I just have to move it back two spaces, so I get 0 0.6, okay? Eight out of 10, I can do eight divided by 10 on my calculator. Got my fancy calculator right here. And it's gonna be 0 0.8. I actually didn't need a calculator for that. Okay, the third one, that's already a decimal, so I can compare that. Whoa, that one's looking like the least likely right now because it's only 0 0.3. So that's looking pretty unlikely. 20% as a decimal, I can move that back two spaces and I get 0 0.2. And then 5 sixths, 5 divided by 6. My calculator, okay, yeah, 0 0.83 repeating. Okay. So which one? Okay. So we have to figure out the least first. So the least is going to be this one right here, 0 0.2, which was 20%. The most likely is going to be this one, five out of six. Okay. So yeah, the easiest way to do that is to change them all into decimals and then figure out which decimal is the greatest and which one is the least. All right. Question 12, an evil computer randomly selects a letter from the alphabet. I don't know why it's evil, is it? It's gonna use the random letter. It's gonna use the random letter to do some nefarious stuff. That's a vocab word for today. Okay, how many different outcomes are in the sample space? So the sample space is all the letters in the alphabet. So if you don't know how many letters are in the alphabet, I'm gonna tell Miss Larson, but there are 26. Or Miss Monson. I forget that Miss Seamouse that welcome Seamouse students. So part B, what is the probability the computer produces the first letter of your name? Whoa, what is the first letter of your name? Do we have any students out there named X-Ray? I don't know. I don't know if we have every letter represented in the people that are gonna watch this. But the answer to this is it's going to be um, the total outcomes of the first letter of your name. So the first letter of my name is D. So that's gonna be, so there's only one D in the alphabet. And that's out of how many in the sample space. So. It's one out of 26. I probably could have explained that faster, but I'm still thinking about what is the motive of this evil computer? Why is it doing this experiment? But our answer is gonna be 126. And let me see, does it have that as a fraction or as a decimal? Okay, it does have it that way. Okay, we have sadly come to the conclusion